Today we're gonna to be talking about how much you should make before you buy your first supercar, and then how much you should be making kind of along the way as you progress up in the supercar chain. Now, take it from a guy that owns over $20 million worth of cars and 25 plus super and hyper cars. Listen up, there's gonna be a lot of awesome information. First up is the starter supercar. Now before I get into the supercar, I wanna mention that I didn't actually buy my very first supercar until I was 35 years old in 2018. I'm a pretty conservative guy, I'm pretty cautious, and I'll get into some other things that you should look out for before you go buy your first supercar. There's a lot of important things that should be taken care of first. So I say that this is the starter car because not only is it one of the lower end on the price spectrum, but it's also a car that I bought on Copart. I paid $85,000 for this and it had some light front end damage. We were able to fix this up pretty cheap. It was probably under about $15,000 to get this thing fully fixed up. So all in, I was a little over $100,000 to get this one of one Maritime Blue rear wheel drive Audi. Now I say it's the RWS rear wheel drive model because that actually saves a lot of money. I think those are about twenty dollars to $30,000 cheaper, but a lot of people don't know it just by looking at it. So essentially you've got this cheaper car that's rear wheel drive, saves you money, had some damage on it and I was willing to fix with it. When you get a starter supercar, what you shouldn't do is exactly what I did and that's put a bunch of modifications on it. So I did an Alpha A10 twin turbo kit on this, exhaust system with downpipes, spoiler and wheels. That probably cost me in all about seventy dollars to $80,000. It did get a lot more performance out of it, but not money well spent because I'm probably only gonna see maybe 30 to 40K of this when I go to sell it. So I'm just pointing it out that it has mods. Probably not a good idea if this is your starter car. All right, so Google will tell you that you can basically afford 10% of your annual income to spend on a vehicle. So if you make $100,000 a year, then you can put $10,000 a year towards your car payments. Now, that's pretty accurate, but there definitely are some things that you can flex on, and I'm gonna tell you about that in just a little bit. There's some cool tricks where you can basically allow yourself to afford a little bit more of an expensive car, depending on what stage of life that you're in. Now, because this car was around $100,000 all in, the payment was right around $1,600 a month when I did a 4.5% interest rate with 10% down. You should be able to put 10% down as well. If you can't put that 10% down, you're probably not ready to afford a vehicle. That one, I do agree with, and I would stick with that. If you can't put the 10 grand down on a 100 grand car, you're probably not ready for a supercar. A $1,600 payment per month is about $20,000 a year. So you need to make about $200,000 a year to be able to afford this. An even easier rule of thumb is basically take your income, cut it in half, and that's the amount of car that you can afford. You make $200,000 a year, you can afford a $100,000 car if you finance it. More on that in just a little bit. Next up is the clout level supercar. So these are the supercars that are a little over $200,000. Really, they only manufacture supercars. So Ferrari, Lamborghini, McLaren, they only build supercars. And these are the cars that you typically wanna flex or make a statement with. This is my 2017 Ferrari 488 GTB. I paid $220,000 for this about two years ago. Let's get into the current market. I promised you that I would, and it is stupid crazy. So, this car is currently going for just under $300,000 after me putting about 8,000 miles on it and after two years. That never happens. This is not a good market to buy a supercar that is in the clout level or in the uh, Audi level that I just went over. Do not, do not buy a supercar right now. Do not. You are gonna get hammered in just a little bit. I worry about local car dealers that have a lot of inventory of supercars. There is a bubble that is gonna burst once the supply chain thing gets figured out and it's gonna be bad. That said, there is a supercar that I just bought and I'm gonna go over in a little bit why that one was an awesome purchase and I still would have gone and bought it even in the current market. Let me give you one of the most ridiculous examples of how bad this market is. My very first supercar that I bought 2018 was a 2015 Lamborghini Aventador. Big flex, clout car for sure, right? Paid $312,000 for it, put 10,000 miles on it. Just a few months ago after owning it for four years, I made almost $50,000 selling that car. Now that $312,000 car should have been worth about $200,000 in a normal market. We're talking about a $150,000 difference selling it at 360 where it should be worth low twos. Dangerous, scary market. Avoid buying supercars right now. Wait until that bubble gets back down to where everything is well below MSRP. Another thing to look out for is depreciation. In a normal market, again, this is a stupid, stupid market that probably will never happen again. But in a normal market, you're gonna lose about 20% of that car's value in the first year. So you go buy a $300,000 car, you better believe that thing's gonna be worth 240 grand or less. Now that's a big loss in value, and that's literally $60,000 off of the total asset amount that you own. So we talked about the clout level supercar being in the two to $300,000 range. As I mentioned, this was $220,000. That means that you need to have a salary of around $440,000 a year to be able to afford a car like this. Kind of crazy, isn't it? Probably more than you expected. Again, we'll talk about ways to get around that in just a little bit. Since I'm an owner of Fitment Industries, Custom Offsets, MA Performance, and a slew of other online automotive companies, I have to represent this vehicle with some awesome wheels. So a lot of my vehicles have aftermarket wheels. This one is no exception. I have the carbon aero piece. I have the full Vorsteiner aero kit. 
Again, not a great idea to add a bunch of modifications like this that are twenty to thirty thousand dollars in value. But boy, does it make this thing look freaking awesome, doesn't it? This is one of my favorite, most tasteful cars with the aftermarket modifications we made. Something extremely important to keep in mind as well is the insurance cost on these vehicles. Certainly more money than a typical average Chevy or whatever it may be. However, I have awesome, awesome, cheap insurance. Click the link in the description when we're done with this video and you'll see a full vlog that we did on all the insurance costs for a lot of my vehicles. They are shocking, I promise you. Literally shocking how awesome my rates are. While I say that, go talk to my boy Nate at Country Financial Insurance in West Chicago. Google that number, Bailey, throw it on the screen. Give this man a chance to give him a, to get you a quote. It's shocking, literally shocking how awesome they are and how great the rate is. Next up is the investment slash enthusiast supercar. This one is a 2006 Ford GT. It was the second to last one that rolled off of the assembly line. This is a vehicle where you buy it. It may not be quite as much of a flex as a Lamborghini, a Ferrari, but you know that it's probably gonna make you money in a normal market. Again, we're in a stupid market, keep that in mind. Uh, this one I paid right around $300,000 for. Today's value puts it at $450,000 with this paint specification and the mileage. So at $450,000 in value, that means you need to make $900,000 a year to be able to afford this. Now, now we're gonna segue into the part where there's a lot of different things in your life that can alter what you're doing, right? So. A few of the questions that I get asked are, should I be investing my money elsewhere? Should I put it into my 401k? Um, should I be investing into my business? I would say that there are a lot of very good questions, right? And if you have a great business, a solid idea that you're executing, your money should always go to your business first. If there's something, if there's a business idea that you can grow, nurture, and you know will be successful, that's where I'm putting my money. And that's why I waited 15 years to go buy a super or a hypercar. Um, I was not comfortable until I was there. Again, I'm quite conservative with that. Um, 401k, by far the best bang that you can get for your buck. Your company matches your 401k, so you literally get 100% return on your 401k. Make sure you fully invest into your 401k before you go buy a supercar, period. Best money that you can get. Real estate is also a super stable, awesome investment opportunity that you can have, and I also bought a lot of real estate before I bought any of my super hypercars. Um, you can typically expect to earn around 20%. Now that's, it's a little complicated how it works, but through appreciation, depreciation, and receiving rental income, it typically will equal that 20%, and that's a rare return that you're really not gonna get on a supercar. So there's really, there really is a major just clout factor to owning a supercar. You, I mean, it, you'd be hard pressed to find someone that owned one that doesn't want just a little bit of clout. And to a lot of people that's important, clearly to some degree it's important for me. Um, so if clout is important to you, great. Go buy a supercar, flex your success. You worked hard for it, you deserve it. I have a lot of white collar people come up to me and say, how do you manage these cars? How do you try to make money out of them? And I tell them, I don't buy my cars as financial investments. I buy them as experience investments. I buy them to let people in them, experience them, go drive them, have fun in them. Really, it's all about just having fun and enjoying my vehicles. If I can make some money, great, but that is certainly not on the forefront of my mind when I'm going to buy these. Of course, when I do buy a vehicle, I am actually very frugal. I do look at used vehicles when I can. We'll talk about a new vehicle and how that was, again, one of my best investments that I've made. Usually a new vehicle is not. Um, but usually I'm very frugal. I will go shop and find the color that I want and I will go find the cheapest one that makes sense and is in good mechanical condition. And then we'll have it shipped in and then I'm usually not there on the, delay that, the day that it arrives, unfortunately, but whatever. When I say I buy vehicles, I've now passed that task on to Mr. Thomas. He goes, yeah, I do a lot of research. I get the color I want, the mileage I want. No, that's like me 20 hours a week, like trying to find cars on and off market going crazy, but we get them. It's a lot of fun and I love it. Some of the other vehicles that I own that fall into that investment slash enthusiast category are my Lamborghini Countach my Mercedes SLS AMG, my 1988 BMW M5. Check out that build series. We're hacking the crap up out of it. Gonna get a Ferrari Testarossa. What else, Tommy? He goes, an M5, we're gonna chop it apart. That is not a good investment car. <laughs> where literally you bought it to cut it apart to ruin the value. It's, you're right, that's a good point. Some other areas where you can flex on that 10% rule or half of your annual income is your seasons of life, right? Are you married? Do you have kids? Are you living with the parents? If you're living with the parents, I hope you don't go buy a supercar, but you certainly would have a lot more disposable income to go do it, so maybe that is the right move. If you're doing well, you're just getting out of college, living with the parents, making good income, you've got more disposable income. Maybe you can flex up to 20%. Um, are you living humbly in a smaller home? Um, are you renting? Do you have roommates? Um, all things to consider that will allow you to flex additional money, especially where you live. Could be a very different, Chicago is quite expensive, New York is expensive, but if I lived in Southern Illinois or Wisconsin, cost of living is significantly lower, so I can certainly flex on that number. So I think that 10% kind of ties to a, a typical region like a Chicago area, um, but ultimately you know what you can afford if you're good at budgeting stuff, and, and you probably know whether or not you can make that flex 
uh, to a higher mount. And again, a lot of it just depends on, on how important that clout and that experience of the vehicle is to you. While I mention that, typically when you start buying super and hyper cars, though, there is an expectation of other people that, that your lifestyle kind of matches that. Uh, so people tend to start dressing a lot nicer, wearing suits. They have to get that bigger and better house. They have to go to that bigger and better restaurant. Um, and I've certainly seen some of that spill over into my life, except for the clothing. I just like my sweats and my t-shirt. That will never change, I'm sorry. Comfort, just for the job you want. I've said it before, retirement, unemployed. $120 for pants. <laughs> well, that was your fault. I know. Some of the problems with that whole logic about buying the bigger house, buying more expensive watch, whatever it may be, is it can be a very dangerous spiral that buying that supercar does elevate your status and you can get yourself into financial trouble. So be careful for that. Make sure that you always have that comfort blanket to be able to afford your rent, something that might go wrong with your house, blah, blah, blah. This is a limited edition, need to have an existing relationship with the dealer, serious collector car. This one you cannot get right now for less than double the MSRP. Because I have a relationship with McLaren, they were able to get me an allocation for this vehicle. I just had to trade in my 720S with them. This is my 2022 McLaren 765 LT Spider. The MSRP on this thing is $440,000, which means you need to make, again, like the 4GT, almost $900,000 to be able to afford this. Very expensive. However, the unique thing about this car that I discussed earlier, or I alluded to, was that I paid 440K for this, they are going for double that. So they are going for nearly $900,000 because it is a rare vehicle. They only produce 765 of these, extremely hard to get right now in the Spider model. They actually stopped production of this. So this is a great opportunity that you can get when you know you go pay it, you're gonna double your money right away. This is almost the investment quality you can go turn and flip and make a buck right away with a car like this. Problem with that or the risk is that if you go do that, then you're probably gonna lose a future allocation with McLaren. So you're kind of damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. And the relationship with McLaren is very important. In fact, if I didn't own my P1, my Senna, or the 720S that I traded in for this, there's probably no way in hell that I would have got this allocation. Because I knew this car was rare and it was gonna be worth more than what I paid for it, I actually went and did all the specifications myself and I tried to add a couple rare things that I thought would add more value to this. This thing is stacked full of carbon and a lot of awesome stuff. One of my big things is color matched interiors, of course. You'll see that on a lot of cars that I'm starting to spec now. I would never, I want to be very clear that it, I will be very hard pressed to go buy a brand new supercar if I think that it is going to depreciate. Even with having a collection as big as mine, you probably will not go see me buy a new supercar if I can go get one that's two or three years old, the same body, low mileage, and go save like 20%. Right now in this market, you're basically paying MSRP for a three, four year old car, so it's crazy. And again, I'm just not buying right now. Um, but I know that this bubble will pop and in a year or two, there'll probably be great opportunities to get some really cheap supercars again. And by not buying, of course, he means he got four cars in the past week, but um, that's besides the fact. <laughs> right, and one of them being a LaFerrari. But would I go buy a Lamborghini Huracan, a Ferrari 40 think, GTP, an F8? No way well, in I'm hell. Serious. I think the, the past five cars you got in the past two weeks or whatever, yeah. all of them you could sell this week for more than you bought them for. The biggest risk right now is that two to $300,000 clout level supercar. Um, those are the ones that seem to be getting hit the hardest. They're not the investment level. They're a little more expensive. They're not one that you're buying at Copart and trying to really, really price shop. Uh, those are the ones that I worry are gonna cost you $100,000 in depreciation or even more uh, if you go buy one today and wait a year or two. Bad move, don't do it. One of the most important things to also think about is the maintenance on vehicles. If you buy a vehicle that is out of warranty where if you're buying used, that's probably is the case, maintenance is stupid expensive. I do wanna point out that I do finance some of my vehicles and I will not pay over 4% as a finance rate. I won't do it, I'll pay cash if that's the case. Now, it's really smart to actually go finance a vehicle if you can afford it, because you can just keep the money that you would have spent on the vehicle and go invest it somewhere and get more than that 4%. So I do have a stack of titles sitting in my safe at home. Granted, I don't wanna have all this money extended out, but at the end of the day, um, do whatever works best for you. Thanks so much for watching. Hit that subscribe button, please. We have some awesome content coming up on all the vehicles. And uh, just hit that button below. We wanna get to 200,000 subs. Check out our social media channels, Instagram, Go check us out on TikTok. Also, if you have absolutely any questions on how I afford these, finance them, structure them, whatever, put a comment below. We will answer your comment, I promise. <laughs> this is, this is what Steve does to people. You're just like rocking back and forth. That's her <laughs> vlogging. He makes me nervous.